Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm Jackie. Hi. <laughs> I'm the I'm the education coordinator. Well, let's see. The music's still playing. Let me see if we can get the music down, down a little bit. Give some time for people to come up. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. This is going to be a wonderful event. I'm excited. Um, I'm Jackie Burke, the education manager for National Writers Series, which is a new role that they put together to provide some really wonderful programming. Not only do they bring wonderful authors to town, but National Writers Series also provides a lot of really important programming to our local, local young people. Um, so you may have a brochure in there. There might be an insert that talks about the different programs that we have. So I want you to make sure you read it over. And if you know any young people, pass it along. Um, a lot, I find that a lot of kids might not know that they even like writing because they haven't been exposed to it. So encourage your kids and your friends to, to get involved. And I'm going to be here afterwards. So if you have somebody that you have in mind that might be interested, have them come find me and we'll talk about it. So right now, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about our scholarship program. We have given $70,000 to local young writers through our scholarship program over the years. A lot of what we do with our program um, programming is thanks to donations from you. A lot of donations support our Raising Writers program. So tonight we have um, our poetry winner here to read her poem, Happiness is Cresting for Us. So you can find her poem and other works by our young writers in this book, which you can purchase outside of the Horizon um, table. And I'd like to welcome Ella Rintla to the stage to read her poem, Happiness is Cresting. Before I start, I'd like to give a big thank you to Bob and Marcy Bransky. Happiness is Cresting. One, May. Up through the blinds in the bathroom, the moon is cold on its black paper. The Pennsylvania water pricks my dry-picked, oil-seeping skin and drums my tired bloat. I'm a vinyl balloon inflated to capacity. I buzz as the air escapes. As I fizzle out, I towel myself off, different this time to keep it exciting. I make faces in the mirror through weeping stripes of wet. My matte lips twisted a fragmented frown, blurry and bored. I, no I look now at the sliced up sky and notice that the night is tumbling through the cracked window. The air is warm, but its edges cut coolly and the moon has started seeping. Its beams are knotted around my neck's taut tendons, crackling like dry roots at the stab of a shovel, yet it means nothing. It's just a note taped to the wall in the hallway, a chill, cresting, and happiness will crash with the white wave. Some people's faces remind me they only have a hiding skull, and their, my, skin smells like both dry leaves and leaving dry. When I dance in my room, I can't help but reincarnate a weightless shadow as a sleepy audience. I can't help but hope its belly glows and chest thumps at my familiar form and my purple joy. Together we watch the sun fade in ruby violets and blue blacks. The oxidized blood seeping into coffee stains, seeping into sea foam into quiet blue. We joke that the clouds are so small and round, it's like I poked circles out with a hole puncher so I could pile the sheets of the sky into my plastic binder. But I can puff air into daydreams and only feel them if I want like the socks clinging to my feet. They make me feel nothing but bored desire to think about something else and maybe itchy. I hope that my belly will glow soon. The girl who told me my aura was yellow told me that tonight there'd be a pink moon, but it looks more blue. Two, June. Mom and I saw two herons at the lake today. They were thoughtfully placed on the shore like wooden sculptures around a fountainous garden centerpiece. The ripples on the lake fluttered like a book falling open, shimmering like a powdery veil, 
like I'd feel its grainy roughness if I scratched the surface, like it'd sting like static. Sitting on the slider, watching the family of loons lunge at fish, I wanted to dive mouth open into the water. I wanted the lake to itch my tongue and throat, cool and heavy in my sandy lungs. My favorite rock that Arizona Marie placed in my palm was black and flat like a pupil, speckled with white fossils, like stars through wet eyes, the downy dots on a loon's back, migrating to cool lakes for the summer. My ears are sore from sun squinting. My sternum is sore from smiling so much. Thank you. Okay, you got the tall one now. Um, good evening. My name is Ann Stanton, and I'm the interim executive director for the National Writers Series. And it feels wonderful to be back again. A big thanks to all of you for coming tonight in person, live stream. And uh, it's, it's going to be a really special night with best-selling author Angie Morgan. So Angie's here to talk about her newest book, Bet on You, How to Win with Risk. Our live stream tonight, uh, I, will, I just need to give some thank yous before we proceed. Sorry, I'm a little bit, I haven't done this for a while. But um, so thanks to Traverse Area Community Media, which is making our live stream tonight possible. They always do a great job. Thank you to Cordia, our sustaining sponsor. Thanks to our season sponsor, today's Golden Fowler Home Furnishings. And thank you to our arts benefactor, Northwest Michigan Arts and Culture Network. And a big thank you to our event sponsor, the Michael and Rhonda Estes family. Tonight's event is made possible in part by the Michigan Arts and Culture Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Our major media sponsor who's kicking butt every day, Traverse City Record Eagle, and all of our 2022 media sponsors. And thanks also to our supporting sponsors. They generously donate so much. We appreciate them. And the Cherry Capital Airport, which is the official airport of the National Writer Series. Thanks to Horizon Books, our volunteers, our board, and our small but mighty staff. We appreciate you so much. So I'd like to now introduce host Coco Champagne and author Angie Morgan. Coco serves as the Chief Operating Officer of Haggerty, a special provider of classic car insurance for any of you who have not heard of Haggerty in this room. Um, she is also a member of the Haggerty executive team. She's been with Haggerty for 23 years and does everything McKeel Haggerty doesn't want to do. <laughs> and that is a quote. She oversees the company's strategy, operations, and core values. Uh, Haggerty is special to NWS. They've sponsored Battle of the Books from the very beginning, and that is why 350 kids, well, we've got other sponsor support as well, but Haggerty, they step forward right away, and all the kids can participate. Each team gets a free set of books, and we couldn't do it without them. So thank you, Haggerty. Um, locally, uh, Coco has served on the board of the Downtown Development Authority for Traverse City and on the executive board of Goodwill of Northern Michigan. She holds not one, but two Bachelor of Science degrees from Michigan State University, the first in agriculture and natural resources, and the second in communications. She's married to Tom Champagne, his mom to Mitchell and Claire, and she also has the coolest name in Traverse City, if not the state of Michigan. <laughs> and our author, Angie Morgan, is a proven leader, a successful entrepreneur, a New York Times bestselling author, and a sought-after guide who helps others become the best leaders they know. Angie wasn't born a leader, but she grew into the role after graduating from U of M and earning her commission as a United States Marine Corps officer, where, I love this statistic, she was one of only 1,000 women managers in an organization of 175,000. So that's pretty cool. She endured some of the toughest training on earth to build her leadership and risk-taking skills, 
which she's applied in her personal and professional life to achieve success. She really has the most self-discipline of anyone I've ever met in my life. Um, anyway, she now shares these exact same skills through her work as a keynote speaker, consultant, coach, and advisor inside the world's top organizations. She's author of the New York Times bestselling Spark, Leading from the Front, and her newest book, Bet on You, is a game-changing book for professionals who are contemplating taking risks in their lives. She's a former board member of the National Writers Series, and she's a brainchild of the NWS Battle of the Books, which we've already talked about. Angie doesn't only write about risk-taking, she embraces it in her life. Last year, she and her husband, Ed Witkowski, purchased Morrisel's Cafe in Bakery Downtown, where my husband, Doug, visits almost every morning, and they are happy to have a solid presence in the Traverse City downtown. So, let's see, she is a mom, also, with two boys, judge and guard. Please welcome these two fabuloso women to the stage. Hi, Angie. Hey, Coco. <laughs> uh, what a beautiful night, and just a huge thank you for everybody to come out to Traverse City in this beautiful opera house. It's so great to see a great room full of people tonight, and thanks for spending your evening with us. So, Angie? No, I would like to say thank you, too. I've seen so many family, friends, um, people I've strong-armed to come tonight. Thank you. The bribes worked. I just look forward to having a conversation tonight about betting on yourself, risk taking, and hopefully you can take the conversation and my hope would be leave inspired to do whatever it is you have in your heart and in your mind. And that's the goal of the conversation, just to really think about enacting personal risk in your life to achieve whatever it is you want to do, but just wonder when is the right time to do it and if you can in fact do it. So, um, you know, Angie and I met each other probably, would you say, eight years ago? Yeah, about Something that time. like mm -hmm. that. And um, we struck a really great friendship, and we've been able to sustain our friendship through something probably sort of different, but we run together. We're running partners, and um, you were my lifeline during the last three years when we were all struggling with... Uh, maybe being isolated and challenges. And um, so Angie and I just decided that we were going to be each other's partner and make sure that we ran together to keep ourselves healthy and keep ourselves thinking about things. And I can't think of anybody that would be better to be a running partner with than you, Angie. You always uh, inspire me and push me to think about new ways to solve different problems. And um, your friendship is something I cherish very very close to my heart. I also, um, I always love connecting with different women, different women that are doing uh, different things in the community, and um, I appreciate so much that you're a mom, and uh, I'm a mom, and working and being a mom, there's a lot of things that you get the chance to, uh, great things and challenging things, and I know there's a lot of things that you um, describe in the book about it, but let's, uh, anyways, there's, let's just uh, share and kind of Pretend like we're on a run. How does that sound? <laughs> and I'll say, too, like, I believe that there's firmly two kinds of runners in this world. There's cat runners and there's dog runners. And if you have a cat or you have a dog, you kind of get the point. Like, cats like to be by themselves and dogs like to be in the pack. And I'm typically a cat runner, but Coco's the only person I've been a dog runner with. And it's part friendship, it's part therapy, it's counseling, it's fitness, it's all of those things. And it was funny, like, the first few days of COVID, um, we felt like since we're sharing our bubble with each other that we were winning COVID because we had balance, we had our laundry done, we had so much time on our hands. And I think like all of us realized nobody really won COVID. And yet um, we're hopefully on the other side of it. But we're here tonight. Yeah, we're here. And nobody's wearing a mask and that's yeah. awesome. So we're hopefully having all that behind us. But um, I love how you frame in the book um, just your perspective on where you are today versus where you started and you attribute so much in such a really unique way around the risks that you took 
And um, I just, have you always been a risk taker, Angie? <laughs> it depends, I think, on how you view risk. So I grew up in Kalkaska. I think there's a couple of Kalkaska folks in here tonight. And yeah, right, represent, good. <laughs> Growing up in a really small community, and not to date myself, but it was pre-internet, and I read a lot, and I think that that was my lifeline to this other world outside of rural northern Michigan, was reading, did you read like the Sweet Valley High books? You know, like the Trials of the Twins, we got some in the audience, you know, but, but there's, that, that there was actually these places called Malibu, and people ate avocados, and it was just kind of really interesting to me. <laughs> and then you grow up, and then you read, sorry mom and dad, like Jackie Collins, probably too young to read that, so you read some trash and smut too, and then you read B.C. Andrews, Flowers, and you just read a lot. I read a tremendous amount, and it just excited me to think that there was this world beyond, and so I think that that inspired me to make some choices, and that was one of the things that we hoped to do about in Bet on You, was just kind of demystify this concept of risk. It's just a decision that puts you on a path towards your intentions and your aspirations. And so I think growing up in northern Michigan and having such a wonderful community and being a reader, I knew that there was more out there, and that set me on my course, and yeah, so I think that I was a risk taker. And I stayed out late and got busted, <laughs> you know, that stuff too. Wait, your mom and dad are here. I think they are. They know, they busted me. They were very well aware of the situation. <laughs> Jerry. Okay, so I have my favorite parts of the book and I don't want to be um, the person that is a, was a spoiler alert. So I won't go into too much detail yet about this, but obviously we were describing this, you join the Marines, there's just a ton of and how you balanced um, the physical demands of that along with the scholastic demands that go into U of M. There were only like 4% women within that organization, so that in and of itself presented its own kind of risks. So talk about that. What does that look like to be in an organization where you know, 96% male dominated and and you, so <laughs> let's talk about that. Yeah, well, let's start with how that even happened. Um, I wrote about this in my first book, Leading from the Front, that I didn't choose the Marine Corps. My dad was a pretty pivotal person helping me choose the Marine Corps. I knew that I wanted to go to the University of Michigan. And my dad had went to Ann Arbor for something, I don't remember what, but he had bumped into one of the officer instructors at the ROTC program, you know, the Reserve Officer Training Corps program. And he came back and he's like, you gotta check this out, they'll pay for college, you can do all these things. And you know, I think it was the pay for college and do all these things that really excited him. But I was, I was like, whatever, I'll talk to the guy. But it really wasn't like a plan. And then after a late night of partying, like the summer before my freshman year in college, I got busted by my dad and my mom. They woke me up very early. I don't remember what they said, but they're like, we're really concerned about you going off to college if you're just going to party and waste your life away. So why don't you try this ROTC thing for a semester? And it wasn't like a, why don't you try this ROTC thing? It's you will try this ROTC thing <laughs> for just a semester <laughs> and see if you like it. And so my, um, they were, again, heavy-handed, directed me towards that. And I got there with the intention that I was going to hate it. But I think parents, and I've got my kids here, so listen to this. This is going to blow your mind. Sometimes parents know more about their kids than the kids know about their kids. Like, there's something that my dad knew about me that this might actually be a fit. And so I got to ROTC, and I was resistant to it. But then there was something about the Marines who were there that just inspired me. They were athletic, they were confident, they had a lot of skills that I didn't have. So it didn't take me long to say like, can I do this? Can I be a Marine? And then, you know, and I don't think when you're young, you know, going back to risk, like you're thinking about the physical risk associated with military service. When you're young, you think you're immortal. And now that I'm like, what, 46, I think about physical risk all the time. Like, ooh, I'm not gonna sit in that chair, it's gonna hurt my back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, so I think about that, so, but, I, but you just don't think about it. You think about, I think, opportunity. And for me, it was like, okay, if I do this, I serve my country, which is important. I 
was getting an English degree and my dad reminded me there was no English factory around, so it got me a job. <laughs> and, and then um, I just was surrounded by the best people in my life. So there was physical risk, but I think I kind of set that aside to focus on more of the opportunity. So yeah, it was, it's kind of funny how when you really want something, you think about the opportunity, not necessarily the risk associated with it. When you look back on that, and um, I love the story about you going into officer, passing to get into the officer mm -hmm. level and um, just all the physical demands of that. And again, you guys are going to have to buy the book to hear that whole story. But um, how did being a Marine really change your trajectory? Or how did that change how you started thinking about risk with your experiences in that? I think the most important thing you learn in the Marine Corps is how you measure success. And in the military, certainly there's mission accomplishment, but the worst thing that can happen is people die. And that changes you when you go to work in the private sector, when you're like, what's the worst thing that can happen? I started working um, in pharmaceutical sales. I had the easiest job in the world too. Like I left active duty in the Marine Corps in 2001. I actually left 10 days before 9-11. And I started working in pharmaceutical sales. I had the easiest job in the world. I was selling Viagra in Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> and my joke is like it wasn't a hard job. <laughs> um, Anne said I could be a little bit. We could swear a little yeah, bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so like you, you then you like see like what people would get worked up about, and you're like, well, is anybody gonna die? Nobody's going to die. Like, this isn't a big deal. Um, this is, you know, we might miss a sales quota. People will be disappointed, but we're, you know, we're going to be okay. And so I think that that, for me, gave me a unique perspective on, I think, risk and cost of loss and things like yeah. that. And I think that really helped. And I think that with that, around that time in my career, it bolstered me to do, to, I think it to be a little bit bolder with some of the personal choices too, starting yeah. a business and writing a book and going down yeah. that path. I mean, the confidence that you must have gained being able to to prove the, that physical capability that you needed to, and I, I was really interested, I never really thought about this with you, and I can't believe all these times oh, we no. never talked about this part, but um, that all of the physical demands are based on a test for a man that's 5'9", and you're 5'3" and that you you did it. And I was reading that part, I was like, yes! I'm like, you're such a badass. So. <laughs> you know, it's so funny though, because what you learned, um, and I write about it in Bet On You, is that the things that I couldn't train for in Marine Corps training was height. And all the obstacles are designed for the average male height, as is much of the gear, like even your like rifle and pistol, and it seems simple, but like a pistol grip, I've got really small hands. And um, I, I've written about this in my other books too, like Marine Corps training is really challenging. I think we can all appreciate that. But it wasn't necessarily the physical challenge, like the, the running and the hiking. I'm a pretty athletic person. It was, sometimes it was the jumping and grabbing the obstacle. And sometimes it was just not being good. And I think about, you know, officer candidate school, which is kind of like a boot camp for officers. Then you go to this like six month, infantry school where you're learning so much about maneuvering and defensive and offensive positions, just things that I grew up with Barbies. You know, they married G.I. Joe, but he'd go off to war, she'd go off to her career. It was just kind of how things really worked out. And so I was just struggling all the time just to comprehend like, okay, why does this matter? How does this fit in? And so it was really the first time in my life that I ever struggled. And I remember talking to one of my instructors about it, and he's just like, hey, everybody struggles with something. This is just your thing. And that was really kind of enlightening. The hard thing was understanding that you had no choice to get through it, but they were going to be there for you. And that was really wonderful. Angie, um, I always think about this when I think about you is thank you for your service. You and know? I always think I spent like... <laughs> Three years in Hawaii, single, at a Jeep Wrangler. Thank you for my service. Yeah. It was like the best time of my life. No. I met the best Americans in this world because of it. So yeah. thank you all for yeah, the opportunity. You're being humble about it. I know. OK. You were 20, mid-20s, and mm -hmm. you started Lead Star. And you wrote your first book, Leading from the Front. I mean, how did you start thinking about making those decisions, measuring the risks associated with that, 
it's pretty amazing that you took the risk and took the leap. Start your own business and to write a book like that. So share with us, how, do you, how did you get from the role that you had in Beverly Hills to moving into starting your own practice and writing your own book? How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it wasn't seamless. And so at the time, um, we're no longer married. I was married to a Marine. We were living on the West Coast. He got reassigned to the East Coast, and I had to switch jobs. And because my company didn't have an opportunity where, where we moved. And so it took a couple months to find another pharmaceutical job. I wasn't selling Viagra. I was selling some osteoporosis mm -hmm. product, and, which is important, but it was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I was making like really good money and I had a company car. I just wasn't happy. And I think like the big connection was that there was something missing about service orientation to my life. And a woman who I'd served with in the Marine Corps, she was making a lot of money uh, in Washington, D.C. as a lawyer on K Street. And she wasn't happy. And she is really great at igniting things. I'm really good at kind of seeing them through. So that was our partnership. So we both, I was driving somewhere in North Carolina. I was talking to Courtney, who's been the co-author, my business partner for almost 20 years. We were just talking about how miserable our lives were. I mean, in reality, it wasn't really miserable. It was actually pretty good lives, but there was just still something missing. And um, we had just seen somebody who was like a peer starting a business and kind of writing on leadership. And we just had this thought like, well, I know them. They're not smart. <laughs> You know, why can't we do that? And then Courtney asked the question, like, if not us, then who? If people around us are doing kind of the things that we want to do and we're looking at them, what's the difference between them and us? And we just kind of isolated it too. They're willing to take a risk. They're willing to sacrifice something. And the, for us at the time, it was sacrificing our time. Um, neither of us had really, I was an English major, but I'd never written anything, you know, I'd say substantial. I, you know, maybe wrote a 20 page paper in college, but nothing like a book. And so we started writing, um, on weekends and in evenings, and neither of us had kids at the time, so we did have some margin in our life to do that. And we would give each other feedback, we'd pass our work back and forth, and it was awful. It was so awful. And then we said, no, we, we really need like a partner. So um, Courtney and I were like, well, we need really a literary agent who believes in us, who can get us into a publisher. So we put together this really crappy proposal. And I say it's really crappy because we're like, okay, give us pictures. And I gave her like this, for this proposal, like a stupid picture. And she actually gave her wedding portrait for the picture. And I'm like, why are you choosing this picture? She's like, it's my best one. I'm like, this is, <laughs> and it was, it was a beautiful portrait. She spent a lot of money on it. But like, that was how bad our proposal. But the, we'd sent it to like 30 different agents and one called us back. He's like, I get what you're trying to do. Your proposal's awful, so he acknowledged that. And then he's like, but there's a way to make this work. And this was really before military writers were really like the jacko, jackos in this world, like we're publishing their work. And so we had a hook, and he got us connected to an offer with a publisher. It wasn't a great offer, but it was good enough for us to say, oh, we can do this. And he's like, you know, if you start a business, if you start talking about your book, uh, you're going to have opportunity. And so we decided to not overnight quit our jobs, but slowly transition into building, you know, starting our company, Lead Star, and then writing our book. And it's, and it's different. Like for nonfiction writers like me, it's different for fiction writers. If you're a fiction writer, you have to submit your whole manuscript. If you're a nonfiction writer, you only have to do like a chapter and your introduction and a marketing plan. And so we had that, and he took a risk on us. We took a risk on us, and it, I'd like to say it magically happened over two years, but it was about a two-year process. Oh my gosh, thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm always curious about writers about how they actually carve out the time to do it. And I was thinking about you, because we were spending a lot of time together while you were writing this book, and you shared with me that you are writing the book, and I've... I, I love the book. You're such a great writer. Oh, so, this, um, but I'm curious about your process. Like, do you like carve out like two hours a day? Do you like 
lock yourself in a room for eight hours a week? You know, how do you, how do you build that discipline and what works for you and what have you found to be really successful? Because there might be some people out here that are emerging writers that we want to share. Yeah, I wish I had, like, I was, I've seen a couple NWS events where you hear about these immaculately perfect writing processes or I've read about Jonathan Cranzen where he gets like a room and he locks himself in and just, you know, chains himself to his desk. I think my best kind of concept is I write when I can. Mm -hmm. And to me, like the morning hours before people aren't awake in the house, I'm writing. So from like five to eight is really when my brain sometimes works mm -hmm. best. But I think when you have a deadline, that's powerful motivation that you find the time that may not work best, but gets the job done. Mm -hmm. And so it's I write when I can. I don't necessarily have a process, but I do have some magic hours. Yeah. And I love the morning. I feel like that's, you know, you your cup of coffee, clarity, it's quiet. That's when I spend a lot of time. But for Bet on You, we wrote it during the pandemic. I just had a lot of, I don't want to say like white space, but mm -hmm. there was a lot of just, you know, sitting in my bedroom late at night writing because, you know, we had all this apparently time to kill and write a book. And mm -hmm. so that's a funny thing about Bet on You. It was um, a book that we had, Courtney and I had conceptualized before the pandemic, but didn't have the time to write and complete. And our agent was really excited about it. But again, we just didn't have the time to complete. But because of the pandemic, um, our business, I mean, we lost a tremendous, so before the, like, before the pandemic, our business was, we travel to client sites, we deliver events, and to large groups of people, but when the pandemic hit, um, in a matter of five days, we lost about a half a million dollars worth of business, and it was gut-wrenching, and so suddenly my calendar was clear, <laughs> and we were broke, <laughs> and so we had to then transition, and, you know, Again, big, fortunately, PPP and everything helped us support our team and our staff, but it was devastating. Yeah. But it presented an opportunity to actually get this work done that needed yeah. to get done. I love how you organize the book. I, um, With my balancing working and being a mom, I don't have a ton of time, but they were like in these groups of sections that I could absorb and read and think about. and. I loved how you organized it. So what was your thinking about the three sections and how you have the book organized? And were you, were you um, intentional about those kind of like, I don't know, like a couple, like an hour setting to read a section of the book and be able to walk away and think about it? And just how you structured it, were you intentional about that? I think during the pandemic, I read, um, Read anybody here read Flea's book from the Red Hot Chili Peppers? I know Judge did. Yeah, my son. <laughs> we, I love, like, that's my favorite genre in this world is um, rock stars who write their own autobiographies. Anyway, I really liked his book because he would have, like, a page chapter, and it took the pressure off of you of having, like, to finish a chapter. And I think people's attention spans, too. So the way that we structured it was in three parts. The first thing that we really wanted to do was to reintroduce this concept of risk-taking into people's lives. The second was helping people plan and prepare for risk. So it wasn't just go buy into the concept of risk. It was really like how to do it. And the third part is really recognizing the biggest risk blockers in this world is fear and the fear of failure. And so kind of helping you see these enemies that you're going to meet in the future and how to deal with them. We also wanted to sprinkle it with stories because that's been a consistent throughout our book is telling stories. But this one was interesting. We didn't just tell our stories. We told stories of people that you may or may not know. Um, Katie Bertudato made it. I don't know if you all know her in the community, but she runs Golden Swan locally. Like she made it in because she's got a really tremendous story. And we also talk about like Dolly Parton in The Rock. So we got some really popular people too. So we just wanted to make it bite-sized, yeah. practical, and actionable, I think yeah. was what. I love it. I, you know, we always think that that's how you can... Um, a concept can be so memorable with, with adult learners is we is the power of the story. And I'm a big Reese Witherspoon fan, and mm. I, I never really put together her story about being an actress and then parts running slow for her and how she was such a ferocious reader that then that started the idea of her, her book club, but then really for the purpose of all of the great things that she's brought to life for us in the production company. So did you have like an excerpt of the book that you'd like to share with us oh. from one of your favorite stories, Angie? I've got a couple, and I'll share the story. But I have to put my reading glasses on because the struggle is real. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I love this story so much, and discovering it was one of like the best things about doing research for this. And so the way that we write in this book is not just talking about risking in career, because we're not just one dimensional people. We talk about a kaleidoscope approach to risking. And so in the book, with that kaleidoscope, what makes a kaleidoscope so beautiful is its chambers and balanced pieces. And we think it's a great metaphor for living our life. So it's not just risking in your career, you know, going for the promotion, the negotiation, all those things. It's also about risking your life. Like maybe it's fitness or you want to learn how to bake better like me. I'm always trying to learn how to cook better. Um, HelloFresh has been a real lifeline for me, <laughs> teaching me how to cook better. But there's also like risking for impact, and that is service in your community or service anywhere because we are a part of a community, and I do think that there's an obligation to give back. And also, um, you know, thinking about these different areas of our lives, just risking for joy is one of the final things we write about because that part of it makes it all worth it. If we're not in loving our lives, if we're not enjoying our lives, what's the point? So this is a story about risking in career, and it's about Dolly Parton. And you may not know the story, but it is wonderful. And the subtitle is Say No to the King and Yes to the Queen. And this is about sticking to your priorities and your values and living your life on purpose. So one of our favorite no stories comes from Dolly Parton, the singer and original singer of the famed song, I Will Always Love You. Dahlia shared in interviews that she knew the song was special when she released it in the early 1970s and watched it rise to the top of the charts. Shortly after its release, Elvis Presley approached Dolly to record the song, a flattering and validating proposition. Dolly was definitely interested until she was told by his manager it was typical for Elvis to retain half of the publishing rights to any song he performed. That caused Dolly to pause. In the music business, it's well known that the songwriter, not the singer, is the one who often benefits greatest from a hit. And Elvis's song would definitely be a hit. Yet his success with her music would require her to forfeit something she valued greatly, her ownership of the song she created. Dolly turned down the request. She told the king no, passing up on an opportunity to earn a lot of money. But she knew there was something more valuable than cash. Her integrity, her vision for herself, her standards, and her own personal expectations. What's more and what makes this move so gutsy? Dolly made this decision without any knowledge that 20 years later, a movie called The Bodyguard would come around. Whitney Houston would record the song, not ask for any rights, and her version would smash Billboard's records. Dolly would later say that Whitney's success with her music made her enough money to buy Graceland. <laughs> Isn't that just powerful? I love her. I know. Isn't Isn't she one of the people that invested for the COVID vaccination as well? She did. did. Didn't Dolly do that? Yeah. And she's done, I think somebody local here too is walking around talking about her foundation today that she does for giving books to families. So thank you. If you're in the audience, certainly be sure to stop by and say hi to her. So um, let's talk about the misconceptions of risk. I mean, it's so much, I love how you frame it around thinking through decisions. Um, but what would you say, you know, in your book, you're kind of highlighting those three misconceptions of risk and what we can do about that. I think the first thing is that when people hear the word risk, they have this impression that it's go to the bank, take out my money, go to Turtle Creek, put it on Red 21, and with like a spin of the roulette, you either win or lose. And so I think that's risk conception number one, that we often see risk as the opposite of reward. Risk versus reward is how we get that presented to us all the time. But if you think about the most significant things that ever happened to your life, it required risk. So don't think about risk versus reward. Think about risk is the path to reward. And it's funny about this stage in our life, because again, if you've been married before, if you have kids before, like those are like huge risks, or even going to college, it's a huge risk. Like, you know, success rate in college is 50%. And if you told me, hey, Angie, you know, you're gonna take this plane to Tampa and it's got a 50% chance of landing on a runway, I would say, no. no. <laughs> I, would say no. no I wouldn't you send you off with, you know, <laughs> soap and a robe, <laughs> the yeah. dictionary, all those things that we do. But so what makes these things unique about this stage in our life is like the choices that are in our minds are more like less society approved, not a lot of people are doing it. 
Um, but probably the chances of success are greater because you've thought on it and they're like really authentic mm -hmm. to you. So again, risk is that path to reward. The second thing is that we think about risk as a leap. And I think our society celebrates like, you know, rip the Band-Aid, quit your job, change your life, make these big, bold, epic strokes. Mm -hmm. But those just don't work. It's like, um, you don't have to show of hands here, but if you've ever watched 90 Day Fiance, the reason you watch that show is because it's a bad idea. <laughs> it's terrible. It's a lovely drama, but it's not going to work. It's not sustainable. So risk done right isn't a leap. It's a series of steps. You've got to think about it. You've got to process it. And you have to slowly buy into the behaviors to make it successful. So some of the best, it's like those you know, people that we say are overnight successes really was like 10 years in the making. Like, success takes time, so be patient with that. The final thing is that we think that we can avoid risk. And you hear that, oh, I don't take risks. These are often the same people who haven't been to the doctor in two years, and maybe they have a family history of cancer, or they think, like, I'm just going to hide out in my house and not realize, like, you know, we're humans, we need community. Or maybe they have all their, you know, stock, op you know, stock in one company. So it's like we take risk. And so if we have risk that's around us, shouldn't we know something about it? Yeah. Shouldn't we use this to benefit our lives? And so it's just a decision. That's like the, the final point about risk is that it's not this big thing. It's just a decision followed by action that gets you on the path. Yeah, I love that. We have, um, I invited some friends of mine from work and we think about risk in a way of frequency and severity, don't we at Haggerty, right? <laughs> and um, it's As you should, at your insurance should. company, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting to kind of turn the tables on a conversation about risk from a business sense and what the work that we do, but to take it into thinking really about yourself and just that commitment about yourself. and. Um, how you're always you know, thinking about developing yourself. And one of the things that I love that you guys talked about early on in the book is just knowing yourself and knowing yourself and getting that good feedback about yourself. But um, I loved this piece around your safety net. So can we just go there a little yeah. bit about safety net and how do you get, I think you described it, was it three different kinds of people that you need to have that are in your community that are helping you establish the safety net and then ultimately but yourself being your own safety net. So let's let's unpack all of that excitement. So this is all, this is some chapter two. I think the first piece that we really wanted um, people to realize about um, taking risks is that the best ones are self-authored. They come from, you know, kind of your visions, your intention, because the world, as you know, is full of recommendations and suggestions about what you should be doing. And while it's nice to hear from other people about the things that you should be doing, we're probably all in a stage of our life where we need to turn inward a little bit and think about what is what we're being called to do and then reach out to other people. So we talk about, too, the value of people, specifically three types of people in our life. Um, we have champions, people who we can reach out to, who, have, who maybe are doing the things that we're doing and we should inquire about it. We also have these people called big stagers. You know, I'd say influencers. People have a community of people who are like-minded. You know, I think of like Brene Brown, who I know mm -hmm. we both yep. adore, Simon Sinek, like all these kind of thought leaders that are amassing these people together that have these ideas that we could listen to their podcasts and stay inspired. And the third group of people are the no-choosers. These are the people perhaps you work with, family members, except you know you might have chosen a few people in your family <laughs> to be a part of the, mm -hmm. the troop. But we need these people around us to either inspire us or just pay attention to us, but listen to ourselves first and then seek influence. And then remind ourselves, too, that no one's coming to save us. You know? <laughs> you know, that we think, and I think the pandemic was a great example. We thought maybe our employer would save us or our government would save us or all these other things would save us. But at the end of the day, you save yourself. You are your best safety net. I have a friend who um, was contemplating a risk that she wanted to take. And she wanted to go from the executive director position that she had with the nonprofit association into a consultant space mm -hmm. so she could be an independent contractor. And she had an easier time imagining herself as a crack whore on the streets of Chicago <laughs> than she did as somebody who could double her salary in three years. 
And it was just amazing to me. And I kept on saying, don't you think you're going to catch yourself at some point and say, no, no, I need to go back <laughs> and figure this out. <laughs> and it's like, you've done all these amazing things. Like, you're going to make sure that you're going to see yourself. And it's, I don't know that we get tested enough like that in life, that we have to learn that self-reliance and self-resilience. But test yourself. You'll know how to get yourself back in the game. Yeah. Um, so it, a little bit more about the safety net and kind of, in a way, how you made this come alive is you, you got personal with us, I with did. your readers. You did. And um, wow, <laughs> you did it. So uh, that was an intentional decision, and it was really generous of you to be personal with the readers to help tell the story. Um, how, how did you get there? How did you, how did you get comfortable with the risk of telling a personal story? And so one of the things that started probably when I first started writing is that what I know people care most about is that authentic voice from a writer. So you just get a little bit more comfortable with sharing your life without fear of judgment. And so leading from the front, I wrote about something very personal, which I think was my first real test of this concept. It was my brother's suicide. And it was really hard to talk about. But through that process of sharing that, I met other people who had had this happen, and it just was a powerful connection to know that you're not alone. And Spark, you know, I talk about more of my insecurities and, you know, things that I kind of went through as I, you know, went through the Marine Corps or even starting a business. And in Bet on You, I wrote about the process of going through a divorce. And if you've ever had that happen to you, it's a pretty identity changing experience. It's powerfully overwhelming tremendously painful and sad, but I really wanted to write it because I think that was the best story I had to really reinforce that you're your safety net. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go through a divorce, it's certainly a financial hit on any of you. It's an identity hit, but the financial piece, you know, again, maybe the things that you're thinking of contemplating, maybe it's a side hustle, maybe it's starting a business, maybe it's something, like you're thinking about your finances, and I thought about that when I was going through divorce, like maybe I shouldn't be an entrepreneur, maybe it's too risky, I've got two amazing kids, I wanna be a little bit more stable. But then I just reminded myself, wait a second, for 17, 16 years, this is the life I've been living. Why should I question this now? I am my safety net, I can do this, I've been doing it. And it's just those amazing, powerful moments of self-doubt that you just have to pull yourself back and say, you know, I've really survived 100% of my bad days. I'm yeah. going to have more in the future, I'm sure of it. But I have something here that's been really working that I need to draw upon. And maybe it's self-confidence, maybe it's resilience, yeah. but maybe it's, a, a, maybe it's belief that you can do it. Yeah. Um, it's hard as self-employed and everything you know, that you had kind of um, just uh, data points for your evaluation of your risk, I guess I would say. You know, mm -hmm. I've been really fortunate to have spent 23 years at an amazing organization at Haggerty and really get to work with um, some really smart people, but people that really care about people. And um, so that allowed me to kind of balance my profession with having a boss that cared about what I cared about. And he knew that... Um, what was most important for me is those critical times that I could spend with my kids. And um, so that made it a, a way for me to be a, a successful executive, but most importantly, to not mess up the most important job of my life, which is to be the mom to Mitchell and Claire. So I'm really curious that you're a working mom and how you've done it. Can we get personal about <laughs> those challenges of being self-employed, being a working mom, you know, raising two beautiful boys? Share with us, like, how, how'd you do it? There's a lot of store-bought cookies. How are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> store-bought cookies, uh, guilt. No, I, you know, it's funny because running with Coco, you've taught me so many tricks, like, you don't need to go to the dry cleaner. Do you got a dryer sheet? Just throw that in the stuff with your dryer. So I like, learned all these amazing life hacks from Coco, too, but just having friends like you who show me how to do it. I think, um, I, first off, I think the most important thing is I love what I do, and I work hard, and I work when I can, and I work long hours. And I think that's the most important 
thing for me is like I work when I can. So like going back to writing, it's like, it's not, I, I wish I had a perfect life where I had a perfect process. I don't. And I think a lot of people are like that too. It's like we wish, right, that the world was laid out for us to pursue our dreams. It's just, it's not for me. It's, it's like I'll get up early, I'll stay up late, I'll do this, I'll do that. But knowing your values I think is the most important thing. And the like, number one most important value in my life is my family. And trying to make sure that maybe they don't come first from a time investment, but they come first in an attention investment. And so like, you know, my youngest is, we've got another, another lacrosse meet this week. We're driving to Saginaw, <laughs> but it's great. Like I get time in the car with him and I get to be on the sidelines and I get to meet other moms and I get to hear, um, I think the best thing about life is being able to hear people's story and how they do it. So I'm always interviewing people secretly and just trying to get the best yeah. life hacks as possible. I love it. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the book around um, some of the things that I think are important pieces for everybody to walk away with because I read the book and then I decided that this is going to be like my graduation present for everybody this time of year. I bought 10 of them so I can stick the <laughs> cash gift in it, but so that they could walk away with maybe thinking about themselves in a different way before they enter into this next um, version of themselves as they go from you know high school and into college. So um, one of the things that I thought was so interesting about the hesitancy that people have around risk, and you describe it in a couple of different ways. You think about um, how somebody you know they have confidence or they have experience. What really comes first? If I'm really going to start taking risks and I have been cautious or hesitant to that in the f in the first place, how do, how do I start to dig into that? I had a really fun podcast not too long ago with Dana Perino, and she used to be a White House, well, she used to be the press secretary in the White House for President Bush, and she was talking about an event that she went to with, um, I'm trying to think of the other press secretary that was there, but it'll come to me later. Anyway, but she was talking about how women specifically, typically, will hear something, you know, for this job, you need these five things, and maybe women will be like, because I do write a lot about gender in in my work, women will be like, well, I've got three of those qualities, but if I go to school and I take this job and I do this, maybe I'll have the experience in three years from now. And then you might meet somebody else who like, yeah, I'm just gonna go for it. <laughs> and I put my thing forward and we'll see how it rolls. And so I think that, that sometimes we, in general, as people get intimidated by the experiences that you need, that we lack the confidence. I like to think though that confidence often comes first Think about us as children. We didn't know how to walk. We had no experience walking, but we got up and did it. And maybe we got some experience. We bashed our head on the floor, you know, the table and cried, but we got up again. Yeah. And so we used even that bad experience as a powerful motivator for future experiences. So I think that's been something that we've been writing a lot and talking a lot about in our work is we're trying to encourage people to pursue. It's like you may not have the exact experience, but don't discount the quality and the other things that you can bring to the table to help bolster you to get in the arena. And then once you're in the arena, you can learn. We write in the book about um, this principle that we learned in the Marine Corps about one-thirds, two-thirds rule. Like if you're a perfectionist, you may delay taking action because you want the sun, moon, stars align before you get out to do anything, but you're not getting experiences. So we try to prioritize action over planning. So one third is like if you had, you know, all this time allotted to pursue a goal, one third should be planning and two thirds should be executing because then you're getting experience that you can build confidence and you're getting learning and you can discover what's not working. And I think that there's often just some bias against getting out there and trying something even like, you know, Instagram, maybe you're trying to up your social game. Yeah. Like you're just wait for, you know, the perfect camera or whatever. Yeah. Just go and try it. Yeah. Do the work. Do the work. Do the work. And don't have this, to this is a theme in my house. We say a lot, do the work. Um, I think the other thing that you point out, and I love how you, how you characterize this in the book, but you talked a lot about people have, you know, fear and failure. And, and, and their concerns around that. And um, I really loved how, I loved how you characterized it and sort of tried to start thinking about how we create a safe place for taking the risks in spite of your own personal fear and in spite of your concern of failure for it. And I like how you really talked about fear there. Um, so 
can you share that more with us? So it's kind of a practical perspective on it. So we wrote about what we call the two FN cousins, fear and failure. They're not the same thing, but they swing in the same circles. And so first off, fear is the greatest dream killer of them all. And people who say, like, I'm not afraid, they're liars. Everybody's a little bit afraid. We might just call it something a little bit different. But certainly fear is part of our nature. Um, we used to live in Virginia Beach right next to where, like, SEAL Team 6 would train. And so those are some of our neighbors and some of our friends. And I'd always ask them just to try to get insight into their careers. Like, are you afraid? And they're like, hell yeah, we're afraid. But you just learn to override it. And that's wonderful. A friend of mine used to say, like, fear is a pink flag that action needs to be taken. And I'm like, oh, that's a really, really great way. So fear, we all have fears. And just having a plan for your fears. Most of what we fear isn't going to happen because of how our brains are hardwired. Like we can, you know, look at a horizon, we're scanning to make sure that we're safe. And when we think of fear, we think of, again, my friend, Crack Whore in Chicago, like we catastrophize the cost of failure. But if I were to ask this group, like think about your life and maybe by show of hands, do this, what have you learned more from life, failure or success? Failure, right? Like, yeah. raise your hands, failure. Like, so we shouldn't be, I mean, don't go out with the intention of failing, but don't be afraid of it either because it's learning, it's discovering, it's developing, it can be embarrassing, but you know, you're gonna forget about it, everybody else will too, yeah. <laughs> and you move on from it. So with fear, just making sure that, acknowledge it, see if it's real, but then think about success too, to spend some time glorifying success and then failure. Just as long as you're not making the same mistakes twice yeah. and you're learning from it, you're gonna be just fine. Yeah, I try to not think about my fear. Like I think everybody has fear. I mean, the thing, maybe this is like an analogy that would be helpful, but I just, um, I have this in crazy fear of snakes and it's because I grew up on a cherry farm and when you're harvesting cherries, a snake can fall from the tree and That's unfortunately to be afraid for me, it fallen in my head. So I had this terrible fear, but I'm an avid gardener and I'm an avid, you know, agriculture person and so I just decided I'm going to stop looking for snakes. That's what I say to myself. But I take that and I think about that when I go to do something that I have fear about doing is I'm not going to look for that fear. I'm just going to, I'm not going to let that get into my head. I know, Coco, you can do this, you know, and I'm just not going to look for fear. So I don't look for snakes anymore, so I don't see them, so I'm not scared. <laughs> you know, it's funny when doing some of the research in the book, what we learned about our personal risk-taking ability is really, it's, it's a mindset, and it's something that's learned. Um, so our risk disposition is a learned behavior, and I think that's really important. So if right now you say, like, I'm just really risk-averse in these certain areas of my life, know that you can learn or relearn your relationship with risk. But the most interesting thing we learned about risk is that the number one most powerful influence on your risk disposition is your mom or your maternal figure. So think about it for a second. Like, your perspective on risk taking is heavily influenced by your mom. And it's not like, well, I hate my mom. It's not like a mom bash. Um, it's just really to understand like, oh, let me travel back in time and think about the things I think about choices that I make. Where did this come from? And so again, it's not to mom bash or blame or anything else. It's to examine and explore and maybe say, well, how might I learn this new relationship with risk? It's also important to know, too, that in our mind, we have these two things called prevention and promotion mindsets. And so when we think about choice, maybe right now you want to you know, invest in a short-term rental because that's the hot thing to do in Traverse City. <laughs> or maybe you want to take an extended vacation or when you, you, you know, the, whatever it is that you want to do. Know that there's these competing mindsets, prevention and promotion, and know that sometimes prevention is just trying to, you know, think about scarcity of resources, and it's trying to win, but maybe you really need to really re-flip the switch in promotion and say, how do I get myself to a place where I can see the opportunity and not think about just the loss? I love it. Okay, I'm going to ask you, uh, do you have any other favorite parts of your book that you want to share with everybody? Because we're going to move into questions from yes. the audience. But before we do that, I just want to give you a chance. Is there anything else? It's so, so good. Thank you so much. <laughs> I do. And I think you want I your glasses, glasses honey? My... Yeah, I do need my glasses. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my high school English teacher is here, Gail Trill. You would be so, yay. I know. I saw her. 
And she helped me believe that I could be a writer and a poet. And I want to say, too, that that, woman up, that young woman up here reading a poet, talk about taking a risk. Reading your work when you're in high school to a group of strangers is probably one of the most amazing things. But I think about what I was reading in high school and then in college. And we talk about this poem called Ithaca. And this is our send off in the book. It's What's Your Ithaca? The poet Constantine Cavafy penned the classic work Ithaca in 1911, a piece that illuminates all that's available to you when you're intentional about inviting risk taking into your life each day. The poem is inspired by Homer's works, The Iliad and the Odyssey, and centers on the Greek king Ulysses, Ulysses a, hero, a hero of the Trojan War, who's leaving Troy and heading back to his home, Ithaca, an island in Greece. Ulysses' voyage takes 10 years. In that decade, Cavafé reminds Ulysses of the dangers he'll encounter on his journey. Lastragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon. Only if he gives them attention and carries them in his soul. He encourages Ulysses to detour along the way into ports he's never seen and to shop and explore. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things. Cavafé reminds him, too, that he should take the time on his journey to grow, visit many Egyptian cities to learn, and go on learning from their scholars. While Ulysses never should forget that he's heading home, Cavafé reminds him not to rush his return to Ithaca, or he'll miss out on the riches the journey avails. Better if it lasts for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained along the way. The journey isn't about the destination. The destination was a direction that inspired the learning, growth, discovery, and opportunity. Wise as you will become, so full of experience, you'll have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. And I think we all have an Ithaca that stirs our senses, entertains our imagination, and creates wonder. It's less of that destination and more of a direction that we walk towards to discover what we were put on this earth to experience and to do. All right. Thank you. All right, um, we're going to see if we can solicit some questions here from the audience. Um, we have microphones, and we have some folks that are going to pass some microphones around. This um, program is being shared um, over Interlochen Public Radio. So it's really important that if you have a question, if you can get a microphone, so um, our friends who are hearing at Interlochen um, Public Radio can also hear the question and get the response. So I, I know we might have some people online that have some questions, but if any of some audience has some questions for us. Oh, you have a question, Gardner. <laughs> There's one right there. Oh, yeah. We have Leah over here. Hi, Leah. Well, I have to say it again with a microphone. Hey, friend. Hey, Leah. Hey. Um, a lot of us who are here are here because we're inspired by you, and you've inspired us to do new things and try new things and join new groups. And Angie, I want to know what you're looking forward to next and what you're going to do next so that we can follow you. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday, we had a wonderful luncheon. I was at Leah's table where we... Uh, celebrated Jean Dorenzi, the Athena Yay! Award winner for 2022. And I love that Zanta has supported Athena for so long. And yes, absolutely, it's just a wonderful opportunity. But they announced that uh, Zanta was no longer going to sponsor this wonderful tribute to women leaders in our community. So wherever Tracy Co is, guess what you're going to do with me? <laughs> Tracy's my partner in crime. And Lauren too. I see you back there. So we're going to be doing that. Like we're, I think that friends of I, we're going to try to help support this really important women's leadership group. So that would be one thing. I. Um, love being a part of the business community. My husband, Ed and I, uh, we own morsels. And so that is the most fun thing in this world. So if you see me working at the register, give me tips, because I love nothing more <laughs> than dollar bills. <laughs> it's like you can get a check, but you can get dollars, and that's awesome. And yeah, that's, are you addicted to the cash? And I'm addicted to the cash. And it's dollars, cash. right? Like It's like I get enough for a good that's bottle of wine, but I'm happy. <laughs> She did you to the camp. So that's that's that. And I've got some other things that I've been buzzing. I think writing this book, like I said, was therapy. 
I, I want to do more like lifestyle coaching, not just leadership coaching in businesses. So that's kind of on the horizon. I'd like to take a vacation. I don't know. Those are the kind of the things. But I'd love to spend more time in the community. I think, I, I don't know how you all feel, but a lot of us kind of turned inward um, during the pandemic. And a lot of us are having a harder time turning outward and giving more of our time, our resources for things that we knew mattered before but still matter now. We just have to have a little bit more courage to go out and support them. So that's really going to be, I think, my big commitment is helping fund and support and really bring things alive. So thank you for the question. All right. Uh, hey, Lauren. Oh, by the way, soon aspiring elected official in the audience. Taking a risk right there. Lauren Flynn, everyone. I am. I am. <laughs> thank you. You inspire me every day, just like Leah says. Um, my, gra my daughter just graduated high school. You know, I have two beautiful daughters. You have two, I can't believe how grown they are, sons. <laughs> I know Coco has got a daughter, but what would you say to the teenagers graduating from TCAPS this year that they should be doing on their next adventures? Mm -hmm. So this might not be what the parents want to hear. <laughs> But just be open to new experiences. That's the one thing I learned about growing up in this community. We have a sense of what jobs we think are available. Growing up in a small rural community, I thought jobs were like teaching and insurance sales and legal. Like there's so many different opportunities. So don't be afraid to get uncomfortable, go a little bit farther than you or maybe your parents prefer, and then come back. Kind of like that poem of Ulysses, come back home, bring your talents, bring your treasures, bring everything back to this amazing community. It's always going to be here, but maybe seek out a little bit and come back. That would be my advice. Thank you. My son up front, Gardner, has a question, and I'm kind of scared. You, 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 okay, you talked out of you it. That was smart. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have a microphone coming right, right over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to stand up, sorry. I just knocked my drink over. Um, Michelle Howard, I'm the library director yeah. here. And of course I love stories, so, um, and we, I'm with some fabulous women leaders. And, um, yes, you are. I would love to hear like a crash and burn fail story. Um, <laughs> because we've all done it. And I think like by sharing that story oh, with gosh. all of us, it makes it easier to fail because that's the worst part is doing that so <laughs> so I have one. like so many to choose from so I'm just going to pick one of the funniest things that um, mm -hmm. and so Ed, um, Ed and I actually went to college together we dated in college and got married um, during well we reconnected during the pandemic and got married so it's kind of a sweet story but you're going to laugh at this because you knew me when I was a young midshipman learning how to be a marine so you go to this like six week kind of infantry environment like boot camp I guess is for officers and you're learning all these things, and for me, it was just kind of an overwhelming learning environment. And I was leading a you know, platoon of my peers into like an attack, and it was awful. I didn't know what I was doing. And you know, you get the, you're sleep deprived, you're tired, and according to my instructor, everybody died in my platoon. Like it was pretty tragic, everybody was died. And I go to my instructor, because everything is graded too, and I'm like, well, did I pass the exercise? <laughs> Apparently, I didn't, because <laughs> of the question, like, and so I had to go do a retake again. And I kind of was like my life in, like, learning how to marine. Did I pass? No, I got to do it over again. Oh, I got to give up a Saturday to do that? Okay, I'll do that. And then you, like, learn, like, okay, you're not perfect. You learn how to fail. And then you learn that, okay, it didn't work this time, but maybe if I try it again this time. And so hopefully now as an adult, I, and I've got, like, really other stupid stories. Like, when we first started Lead Star, Somebody approached us with an opportunity to do our workshops on um, ships, like cruise ships. Get it? Leadership. Oh, I know. It's really smart, right? And we promoted it. We marketed it. We tried to sell it. It didn't work. And that was embarrassing. And I think two people, and it wasn't even me begging my mom. It was not even family members that actually showed up to say that they wanted to do it. So we canceled that. So I feel like there's been tons of those things. Like, I am the queen of try. In fact, we write about this in Bet on You. You know, you're never going to regret trying something and failing. You're going to regret not trying something and realizing later in life, damn it, I had that moment when I could have done something. And so I'm not afraid to try to make a fool out of myself, to put myself out there, share my life's personal stories. Because I feel like if we talk, it's kind of um, counterintuitive. If I tell you all the times I failed, and if I tell you all the things I don't know, 
for some reason, you trust me more. I mean, we're afraid of the people, right, who think they know everything and are keeping secrets from us. And so that's kind of how I live my life. My, my teacher, my English teacher, Gail Trill, right there. She's going to have me recite some of my wonderful poems from high school, I Did bet. Did she teach you how to diagram sentences? <laughs> She's amazing. I never taught diagrams. You did. You're amazing. <laughs> Angie, you were among the first uh, classes to benefit from Title IX. How do you feel that that being able to really compete in sports without a half court uh, <laughs> uh, affected this wonderful attitude you have? I think I had wonderful parents, particularly like I talk about, mom, you know, the mom and the risk. You know, she grew up in an environment where her mom had told her, when a man comes into the room, stop what you're doing and listen to what he has to say because that's more important than what you have to say. And my mom, I think, took that message and later in life thought, well, this is bull crap. And that was how she raised me, like to really be bold and assertive and to speak my truth. So I had that. I had a really great mom who could help me lean into being strong. But then I also had a dad who, again, led me, drug me, pushed me into the Marine Corps. And he never said, the girls don't do that. I mean, he was your boss, and I hopefully <laughs> you, had a, you had a good time too as the principal of the school. Like, he just never put those types of limits on me. So I didn't feel like I couldn't. And I think that because he grew up on the farm and everybody was, you know, an asset that you had to do things around the house that he had two daughters and a son, but he had two girls that he had to deal with and they were treated just like everybody else. Well, you know, yeah. So I think that that was part of it. I think it's the context and then the parenting and then just the opportunity. Thank you for that. And I'd be remiss. I would just love, really remiss. Like, we've got two fabulous leaders here up in front, like Wendy Steele. Like, just think about this woman up here, Wendy Steele, who is gracing us tonight with her presence, starting Impact 100. You know? It's like you think about the global impact she has had in the world of giving. We know it now, but think about when that started. You know, it was a small group. And that just bloomed and blossomed and developed. I wrote right about two in, um, in the book. It's like we think of like Steve Jobs as who he is now, but not about who he was then. Or Sarah Blakely. Like think about Spanx for a second. You know, can you imagine? Like there was a day, like who's going to buy these things and that self-doubt. And now it's like, who knows? Like she invented this whole industry. Even J.K. Rowling, we've heard her story. Like everybody starts from somewhere and they don't know about the outcome. And that's, I think, the point that we're trying to get with the book. It's not about the outcome, it's about the journey and the development, the growth and the process. If you get attached to the outcome, that's not healthy. Be open to that every day, and that's hopefully the message that's in the book. All right, any other questions from the audience? All right, well, I, um, this has been so cool. Thank you. I'm so Thanks proud for doing of you. this, Coco. <laughs> and thank you all for coming tonight. I have a couple. Um, I just, when you put so much of your heart and soul into something like writing a book, and you, and it is, Courtney helped you, but I know you did so much. When you craft something like that, you have to have this end goal of what is it that I want all my readers who invested their time in reading this book, what is it that you want them to take away? So can you uh, give us a little parting shot on uh, the number one thing you want the readers to take away from this when they read the book? I spoke to a guy yesterday who, um, he is uh, retiring from this nonprofit organization, and he reached out to me and he's like, you know what I really want to do is give the second half part of my career and I want to focus on middle school students and helping them see trade opportunities for themselves because like me, college wasn't going to be a fit 
but trade was the path that I want to go. So I wanted to reach these people. And so he was telling me, because of the book, the things that he was going to do to mentor younger kids who are perhaps at risk. And, getting, and that, that, to me, like, is what I hope the book does, is that in small ways or in large ways, that it inspires you to do something, something that's in your heart. Maybe it's a conversation you need to have, a conversation that's long overdue. Maybe it's something, you know, go to counseling. Maybe it's something that is, again, about secondary income source. I don't know what's on your heart. I get to talk to a lot of people. But I, here's what I do know, is that the people who I get the privilege of talking to, like their dreams and their ideas aren't lavish. They're achievable. I believe in them. But I want them to believe in them just as much as I believe in them. Because, again, I think this is where we started. If not you, then who? You don't get to do it. And somebody else is getting to do it. Why can't you? And that's the message that I really hope resonates. You're so cool. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Here Especially, today. but Angie, um, I'm so fortunate to have you as my really good friend and my confidant. And uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for everything you're doing in our community. Um, one thing I want to mention is uh, Horizon Books is out there. Um, nothing like a local bookstore to help provide us with some books. Um, I've, I've been in Traverse City for so long. I remember when Horizon Books was J.C. Penny Jean. Are you with me, girl? <laughs> <laughs> so we're so happy that that's here in our community still for a little while longer, or maybe hopefully for forever, depending on how many of Angie's books we might sell tonight. But um, take a stop and uh, think about our local bookstore and swing in there. Again, I love my idea about giving it to everybody for their graduation present. Don't you think? Oh, I love that idea. I love that idea. That was a great idea. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, thank you, Angie. This has thank been you, a Coco. beautiful night. I don't know. Is Ann, Where's Ann? Is she going to come back? She's right back there. Ann! Oh, there she is. Okay, then I won't mess up. Okay. Hi, Ann. Okay, go, go. We're good. Yo, hi, Ann. Thanks. Hello. <laughs> this has been fabulous, I have to say. What a great conversation. So thank you for coming. Do, are there any? No, I'm happy. I just thank you for coming tonight. I well, I, I, I want to thank you. And I also want to say thank you to Doug Stanton. He took a risk with National Writers Series. Okay. I have to admit, I said, are you kidding? We know nothing about running a nonprofit. And we just plunged right in, and 13 years later, here we are. So thank you. And um, I hope you can join us in August. We've got um, two environmental heroes, Dave Dempsey, Jerry Dennis. They're going to talk about the Great Lakes August 25th. It's not up on our website yet. But, um, you know, everybody has their passion. And Angie and Coco, I'm so glad you came and reminded us of just how much fun it is to go after what you really want. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, and Angie will be signing books in the back, and um, I hope you can buy a copy. It's a really great read. Very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs>